I'm truly honored to be moderating this remarkable individual. A few months ago, I had a chance to hear your speech at COP26. And I have to say, it was one of the speeches that shook me. And it shook me and it instilled in me a point of personal action. Uh, I've heard many speeches, but I think that particular speech brought in me personally a need for action, not at a government level, but also at a personal level. And I wanted to thank you. And, and honestly, when I was told I'll be sitting beside you, I was <laughs> really excited about that. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Motley, I would like to start by saying, what do you mean by global moral strategic leadership? What does it mean to you? Thank you. Well, quite simply, moral leadership, because we need to start doing the right thing for the right reasons. Strategic, because we cannot do everything at once. And we've got to pick our battles very carefully if we intend to have progress and success. Global because the world more than ever needs to work as one on the huge issues. If we didn't know that, and in fact, I laugh because the first time I started to speak about it was in 2018. And at the first UN General Assembly, I started to talk about how similar the world looked to what it looked like 100 years ago. But the difference was is that we know better because we have the United Nations as an institution we have all of these other institutions, the Bretton Woods, World Bank, IMF, etc. And we should be at least in a position to step back from the brink, as well as to be definitive in how we strategize to prevent further disasters and to prevent the kind of suffering that the world has seen too much of. Little did we know that we would have a lesson that would cause us to understand that we are all in this together. And COVID is that immediate, immediate shock. But the reality is that climate is just as much of an issue. And, and I commend you for being the ones who will come in 2023 yes. to have COP28. And I commend Egypt and my sister here for what they're doing with respect to preparations for COP this year. The reality is that the IPCC reports are showing us that more and more we do not have time on our side. And that's why strategic leadership is needed in order to pick those battles that have to be won almost immediately. The morality is critical. And if we doubted it, we only need to look across the world again and to understand why doing the right thing for the right reasons is so critical, not just to our own individual well-being or our national well-being, but to the global well-being of the planet. Do you mind sharing with us some examples of these, of global moral strategic leadership? I think that the issues, perhaps the most telling one, will be that of how ultimately apartheid was dealt with in the world. For decades, the people of South Africa were forced to live in circumstances where all modern states in a post-1945 world recognized that to even assert that a human being of any type could be different or lesser than any other human being was an affront to our sensibilities and to our collective humanity. And ultimately, it was the young people who literally led the battle by saying we were not putting up with this anymore. For many years, countries refused to acknowledge the, the legitimacy of the calls for sanctions and for the kind of isolation that needed to happen in order to be able to bring the South African government of the day to the point where they were prepared to release Nelson Mandela and the many other political prisoners, but more importantly, to create a platform for a free and functioning democracy in South Africa. The absolute moral imperative ultimately won out the day. And we have therefore to recognize that the kind of leadership that has us taken policy decisions that are rooted in principle is what we need. 
And don't get me wrong, principles sometimes are very difficult to, 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 in terms of the consequences that they impose on us. But as I say all the time, <clears throat> principles only mean something when it is inconvenient to stand by them. And that is when you know that you've done the right thing. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the youth and next door we have the Arab Youth Forum as well. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're in a world government summit where the youth are hand in hand mm -hmm. with us in all the key decisions and, and participating. What role do you believe the youth and or technology could play in enabling or participating in this movement of a global moral strategic leadership? Absolutely huge. And, and one of the reasons I call for global moral strategic leadership as opposed to global moral strategic government leadership is that I don't believe it is the province of government alone. I believe that all people have a role to play in being able to achieve the global public goods that just make the world an easier and better place to live in. And young people, if you look at history, are usually the ones in the vanguard of major transformative change, particularly when it is mass-based. In South Africa, again, when you started to see in the late 70s, early 80s, the students refusing to cooperate when they were being told that they had to learn Afrikaans in school, refusing to cooperate in a way that their parents had been subdued. And you started to see some of them just being prepared to lose their lives. And that created then a global movement among other college and university students that ultimately started to raise the pressure in the Western world. And all of a sudden, Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan could no longer ignore. I remember as a student in London, and, and those of us who got involved in that movement um, did so because of the moral legitimacy of, of, the, of the battle that we were fighting. Similarly, if we look at littering, something as simple as that, which countries have been successful in being able to deal with, with the, um, reducing the level of littering? It's those countries that have literally said to young people, you are the ones who need to be able to deal with it. Look at smoking. The people who, I used to smoke, but it was my nieces who embarrassed me out of smoking, largely because they understood that it was no longer the thing to do and it's no longer good for you. More often than not, young people can do it. Technology now has a tremendous role to play because it is the amplifier. It is potentially capable of democratizing movements because of access to information. The problem comes in our being able to determine how we use technology. Because technology, if not used for strong ethical reasons, can be equally a tool of oppression and a tool that literally deprives people of, of the ability to be and to have their own agency. So we have to be very careful how we use the technology. We have to be equally very careful how we impart the knowledge to young people. But if we do it appropriately, they'll run with it. Yeah, and uh, I think the technology angle is interesting because with everything, there's two sides the of, of a story. And tomorrow at the World Government Summit, there is a, a forum on the metaverse. Yes. That itself is, is another domain. I'd love to ask you um, and hear about uh, Barbados' futuristic vision towards the metaverse. You have some interesting projects there. Love to hear that. I'm looking at the, our ambassador. Interestingly <laughs> enough, we opened our embassy in Abu Dhabi yesterday, and our ambassador, Gabriel Abed, is one of the leaders globally on the issues of blockchain. And we're honored to be able to have him as our first ambassador here. In fact, in our first embassy in the Middle East. Um, look, the metaverse just gives us a capacity to amplify our message and to be able to do so to reach far more people as a small island developing state than we may otherwise do. I made the point yesterday at the opening of the embassy that people may wonder how do we, in the middle of an IMF program, in the middle of a climate crisis, in the middle of a pandemic, why have we chosen to open an embassy and to open embassies in Africa and Central America? Our diplomatic policy originally 
and for the first 53 years has been North Atlantic focused, with the exception of maybe China. And when we won the government in, 19, in 2018, we said, look, we live in a global community. Technology now offers us opportunities to be able to have a much wider presence with far less people at a far more efficient cost than hitherto. And if we don't get out there and start to engage with the world, we will not be in a position to produce global citizens with Bajan, Barbadian roots. And that is why we came here. But what the metaverse does is to even allow us to go to the next level. And with the limited resources that we have, to be able to play that role to start to influence, because what is really the purpose of diplomatic engagement? We want people-to-people -people exchanges. We want equally, at the bilateral level, to be able to force the opportunities for business and, and, and other commercial activity and trade. We want, at the third level, at the regional level, to be able to bring regional blocks closer together. So we have a perfect union now. CARICOM is now a, an associate member of the African Union. We want to be able to have CARICOM and the Gulf Council here start to work together. And why? because the fourth level is multilateral. And if we don't start to take common positions together, we're going to be subject to the traditional North Atlantic approaches of divide and rule. And the world now needs us to be able to stand up. What is the moral legitimacy that allows the United Nations to have a permanent five that is rooted in a world that didn't allow us as sovereign nations to have a voice? We just didn't. But today, we have 196 countries, I believe. UN had 50 when it started. How do you accept that you have another 146 countries, but you still have a, a system that defines first class and second class countries? Now, if we accept that there's no basis for first class and second class citizens, then there can be no room in this world for first class and second class nations. And we hope through the multilateral cooperation, which can be propelled further by the metaverse, um, diplomatic embassies in the metaverse, it then allows for far greater collaboration in a more cost-efficient way and hopefully in a more strategic way than hitherto would have existed. Um, the days of telexes and, and cipher offices and all of those are of a time pass. Thankfully. But equally, we live in a world now where that ability for instantaneous communication, anchored by blockchain because you need to have the transparency and the capacity to validate and verify what we're doing is in fact real and true, then we start to begin to have new opportunities. And our country wants to explore it. And, and I'm so happy, as I said, that Ambassador Abed is with us and is literally leading the way. And we would love to partner with other countries who believe also in this vision and mission. Um, your country has been one that has been a pioneer globally on so many things. So I hope that this is an area that we can partner with. Hopefully, yes. I mean, uh, you mentioned when we talked about the metaverse, how small and well-connected the, the globe is. And when you talk about the Atlantic, it's, it's not so far away. That's right. We are the World Expo, and almost every, oh, every single country is here I was fortunate to visit 150 of them. I have 40 <laughs> left in the next few days. But I think the key thing is the World Expo does show us how close we are to each other, and how well connected we are, and how commonalities we have with, amongst each other. So it's really a tremendous uh, uh, opening for all of us. And the metaverse is probably going to even show that even more. Um, I, I, I would say, and, and please let me congratulate you again on the magnificent work that has been done here on this World Expo. Um, I will commend Minister Rima Al Hashimi because I was here two years ago and I saw what was not, and I'm here today and see what is. And the transformation has been nothing short of phenomenal. Um, but more importantly, what you're doing here rather than just building buildings is building trust and building partnerships. And it is those things that ultimately will be remembered more than anything else. That you've had over 22 million people pass through this says it all. 
that in our own pavilion, we've had people more than our population pass through it, says it all. So I really do hope that people will recognize that as human beings, we have so much more in common than we have that separates us. What has caused you and what has contributed to your success? You have a beautiful story to tell and I'd love for us to hear that. And, and not just as a woman, but as a leader who's changed the face of democracy in your country. That's not something small. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. I think that the most important thing is to understand that while history very often is full of examples of progress, it doesn't always happen in a straight line. And my own career did not admit of a straight line because I equally know what it was to have been removed as leader of the opposition and to bide by time and to come back. And I say that because in today's world more than anything else, one of the downsides of technology and instantaneous communication is that it causes people to feel that everything happens like that. And we all know differently. Everything can't be reduced, as I say all the time, to a song bite or to four column inches. That there's a complexity to life and that there are nuances. And more often than not, we have to understand that every experience is a learning experience, even if it is a painful experience. So that the capacity to stay focused, to stay rooted, to stay humble, and to stay on your principles is what matters. Um, am I perfect? Absolutely not. But do I try my best every day to do those things that I've set out to do? That is, that is what drives me. The Honorable, I think that's a very strong message for us all here today, especially it's the closing message. I'm truly honored to be sitting beside a global moral strategic leader. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>